bl block cipher operation or modes of operation. That is, our block ciphers work on, say, 64 bits or 128 bits at a time, but we have data which is much longer than that. How do we handle that longer data? We use one of the different modes of operation. The concept is you take your plain text, divide it into blocks of size which your cipher supports, encrypt those blocks, but we'll see that simply encrypting them without combining them in some intelligent way is not so good for security. These are rather simple, so we'll go through reasonably quickly. Different modes of operation they're referred to. They apply to almost any block cipher. So we've gone through DES, we've mentioned triple DES, we've mentioned AES, there are other block ciphers. These modes of operation in general work for all of them. So the most, or the, the simplest approach, why did I get to there? Again, I'm clicking on the wrong link. Let's go back to the start. Our block cipher operates on B bits. We want to encrypt plain text longer than B bits. So we break the plain text into B bit blocks. And if I have a B equals 64 bits and I have 65 bits, then I'll have two blocks. One block of 64 bits, the second block of one bit, we'll need to pad that second block out to 64 bits. So we use padding where necessary so that every block is of the same size and the size that suits the cipher. And we're going to see that we need different, or there are different modes of operation have been developed to combine the encryption of those blocks together. <coughs> if I can get this to work, I'll be happy. The first mode is the most obvious mode called electronic code book. What we do is take our original plain text and break it into n blocks. So n blocks of b bits in length. And we have a key and we use our cipher, our block cipher, and encrypt each block of plain text P1 to get cipher text C1 using that key K and do the same for the second block of plain text and we get C2, ciphertext 2 and for the remaining all n blocks of plain text encrypt with the same key and we'll get n blocks of ciphertext and we'll concatenate those n blocks of ciphertext together and we get our resulting ciphertext. That's the obvious approach. Plain text, break it into blocks, encrypt each block separately take the ciphertext from all of those encryptions and concatenate them together. This has the problem in that if we have repetitions in the plain text, those repetitions will be present in the ciphertext. A simple example. If we have 12 bits and our block cipher operates on 4 bits, it would break, break those, would split those 12 bits into 3 blocks. This is our plain text. Three, block, 3 blocks of plain text, P1, P2, P3. We'd encrypt each block using our cipher.
and each encryption would use the same key, the secret key K, and we'd get three blocks of ciphertext as output. And let's say there's three blocks are these. Then the resulting ciphertext is just a concatenation of those three ciphertext blocks. That's the concept there. The problem with this is that if, let's say we had a, a longer plain text with a, another block, P4, we'd do the same. What's the output? What's C4? <coughs> what are the four bits in C4? C4. <laughs> what is ciphertext block 4? Why? Repetition. We have four blocks of input, P1, P2, P3, P4. We're using the same block cipher, E. We're using the same key, K. Look at the second block. P2 is 0, 1, 1, 1. We encrypt with key, K. We get 1, 0, 0, 0 out. Therefore, P4 is 0, 1, 1, 1. Same plain text, same key same ciphertext comes out. And there's our problem with the security of this approach, that when we have repetition in the plain text, we have a large file and parts repeat, we only use one key, we use the same key in each of the encryptions. When we have repetitions in the plain text, we'll get repetitions in the ciphertext. Hence, we get some structure in the output ciphertext, making it possible, make it easier for the attacker to do some analysis and to look at that structure to try to work out the plain text. So, the most obvious mode is not very secure. Electronic codebook mode, that's what we just went through. Any problems with that? done it again. Decryption is easy for ECB, we just do the reverse. Take the ciphertext block, use the decryption form of our cipher, our block cipher, use the same key and we'll get P1 and the subsequent P's back and get our plain text. Each block of, say, B, B bits, in this case, in this example, at least 64 plain text bit, bits, is encoded independently using the same key. <coughs> so if we're using DES, we have a 56-bit key, and we'll use the same key in each encryption block. This is useful only if we're sending small, small amounts of data. Because in small amounts of data, it's unlikely to get repetitions. Not so much a problem. With a large amount of data, it's more likely that some blocks of input plain text will repeat, hence some ciphertext output blocks will repeat. And if we can start to, if we know something about the structure of the plain text, we can map the structured ciphertext back to that. But if we just have a small amount of plain text, not such a problem there's less chance of a repetition. So a problem with long messages leads to the need for other modes of operation. Cipher block chaining, <coughs> which you were required to use in your assignment. Here we have our plain text divided into n blocks. What we do is we take our first block of plain text, P1, 
and we XOR it, this is the exclusive OR option, operation, with some initialization vector, some other value that we've chosen. Not necessarily zero. In your assignment, I told you to choose zero because we hadn't spoke about the initialization vector. But we'll see that it probably should not be zero. But some value, if our of B bits, if our plain text block is 64 bits, our initialization vector must be 64 bits, same length, because we're exclusive all those two together. Exclusive all them together, take the output, encrypt the output using key K, and we get C1, ciphertext block 1. And now we chain the output of the encryption with the next phase. That is, we take P2, the next block, say the next four bits in our example, exclusive all P2 with C1. Take the output here and exclusive all, and feed that into the encrypting operation. And we get C2 out. And then we continue for all the blocks. So we've chained together each of the blocks. Eventually we take the last plain text block, exclusive all with the previous ciphertext block, encrypt, and we get the last ciphertext block. You'll see that if we have two input plain text blocks which are the same, we won't necessarily get the same output ciphertext block. What do you think? If the initialization vector is shorter than P1? Why, what if the initialization vector is shorter than P1? It's an exclusive OR. We, when you exclusive OR the two values, you, you need to have the same length. Okay. So if P1 is 64 bits, IV needs to be 64 bits there. In your assignment, you chose an initialization vector of zero, I told you. How long was it? How long? Yeah, your initialization vector. 64 bits, but if you type just the letter zero, it would have worked out or mapped that to a 64-bit <coughs> value. But it was DES in cipher block <coughs> chaining mode, CBC, uses 64-bit initialization vector. Same length as a plain text block. Yeah, it would accept OpenSSL accepts different formats or different structure. Now, if we have two plain text blocks the same, let's say P2 and P1 were the same, same sequence of bits, we take P1 exclusive all with IV. Let's say IV was zero. Then we take P1 exclusive all with zero and we get P1 as an output. Encrypt, we get some random ciphertext, C1. Then we take P2, which is the same as P1, and we exclusive all P2 with C1. <coughs> C1 is not zero. C1 is the output of the encryption, some random 64 bits. So by encrypting P2 with something different than what, uh, sorry, by XORing P2 with something different than what P1 was XORed with, we'll have two different inputs to these two encryption blocks therefore get two different outputs. So here we've overcome our problem. Two blocks which are the same on the input will XOR with different values and therefore when we encrypt we'll get different ciphertext output. So even if we do have the same blocks on input we'll get two different ciphertext values on the output. That solves our problem of making it easier for the attacker because of repetitions. Even if we have repetitions in the plain text in the blocks, we won't have the repetitions follow through into the ciphertext, making the ciphertext less structured, making it harder for the attacker. And all the other ones that we show through have that same property. Yeah? Uh, not guaranteed, but highly likely. So is it guaranteed that you will not get the same value? 
how would we get the same value? That is, let initialization vector is some random value that you choose, 64-bit value. P1 and P2 are the same. I XOR P1 with IV, this random value, get some value. Encrypt, I get some other value at the output. For C1 and C2 to be the same, then this ciphertext C1 would need to be the same as this random IV I chose at the start. And that's very unlikely. What's the chance that effectively two random values are the same is choose two values, two 64-bit values and get the same value is extremely unlikely. You've got a selection of two to the power of 64 different values. The chance you'll choose two values at the same is almost zero. Theoretically possible, in practice, almost always zero. So we won't get, in practice, two ciphertext blocks are the same if we have two input plain, to plain text blocks, which are the same. Decrypt. Decryption we won't spend any time with. I think you can have a look at them in your own time. We will have a couple of examples in a moment of these. Uh, but basically we need to take our ciphertext, <coughs> decrypt using our ci block cipher, using the key, and then to do an XOR to get the plain text back. Rem remember XOR is its own inverse. If I take A, XOR with B and get C. If I take C and XOR with B, I'll get A. So it's its own inverse and we can use it in that way in these ciphers, uh, in these modes of operation. Take the cipher text, decrypt XOR with IV, where IV must be known by the encryptor, the, the source, and the person decrypting the destination. And in practice is normally secret. Best to be kept secret. And we take the ciphertext and feed it into the XOR there and so on for decryption. That's the description. This is commonly used, so it's a general purpose for block cipher, a block-oriented transmission, some authentication. The initialization vector must be known by sender and receiver and should be secret from the attacker. So it's another secret value, really. And it needs to be exchanged between sender and receiver. There are, all, there are others, and we'll go through three or four others, which have different advantages and disadvantages. Cipher feedback mode. Here's a mode that, in general, allows us to produce less than B blocks of output. We have a cipher that operates on B blocks. DES operates on 64 bits. We can use this and also the next mode to produce smaller bits output, S bits in general. Let's see how it works and then talk about the advantages. Choose an initialization vector. Encrypt it using our block cipher. If we're using DES, choose a 64-bit value, encrypt that value using our key, our secret. We get 64 bits out. Select the leftmost S bits. Maybe I just want 8 bits. DES operates on 64 bits. Let's say I want just 8 bits at a time. We'll see why in a moment. Select the 8 leftmost bits, S in general bits, throw the rest, the rest away, discard the remaining bits of the output, and take those S bits and XOR with S bits of the plaintext. And we get our S bits of ciphertext. This is a way of turning a block cipher into a stream cipher. A stream cipher, we normally used, say, in real-time transmissions where the data is generated and as soon as we generate it, we want to encrypt it. 
And the way that we do that with a stream cipher is we take a small block of the plain text, say 8 bits, 1 bit in some cases, take 8 bits of plain text, XOR with some random value and transmit that and then take the next 8 bits of plain text, XOR with some random value and transmit. That's the general stream cipher. And that's what we get here. The output of a block cipher, and in fact the output of any good cipher, should be a random sequence of bits. Have no structure. If it's not random, then there's some structure present in it. So the output of our encryption here, with some plain text in, should be some random sequence of 64 bits if we're using DES. Let's choose the first 8 bits. So we have a random sequence of 8 bits. And let's say I'm using this to encrypt my voice as I talk over Skype. I wanted an encrypted Skype session. When I talk, I generate, or the computer generates data, let's say 8 bits, and we take the 8 bits which were generated of plain text, do a fast XOR operation with those 8 bits which were generated here, and we get our cipher text, and that can be sent across the network. From the perspective of the encrypting and transmission, it's quite fast because if I have these 8 bits, if I've calculated them beforehand, then as soon as the voice 8 bits arrive, as soon as I talk, the first 8 bits are simply XORed and we get the ciphertext and they can be sent. So the process of an XOR or the implementation of XOR is very fast com compared to encrypting. We saw encrypting has many operations. In an implementation, that's much slower than just XORing two values together. So a stream cipher is useful for real-time communications or where we need to be fast. This mode of operation turns a block cipher, this grey block box, encrypt, is our normal block cipher, into a stream cipher. And it also has uh, some chaining. Take this S bits, C1, and feed it into the next input to our block cipher. We started with an initialization vector. We encrypted those 64 bits. What we do is we shift those bits along. Think of it as a register where we just shift those bits along. We discard the leftmost <coughs> bits, 8 bits or S bits in general, and append the S bits from C1. And then encrypt that. We should get a different output. Get a S bits selected, XOR with our next S bits of plain text. Cipher text feeds into the register, shifts everything along, encrypt, and continue. Just to explain that concept of the register there. Uh, what do we have with... I've got another example. With CBC, what we're doing is... Remember our block cipher, let's say, takes 64 bits <coughs> in. This encrypt block has to have 64 bits in. So this is designed to work on as a normal block cipher because we need 64 bits in, we need 64 bits of plain text to XOR with our initialization vector. And we get 64 bits out. The problem with encrypting, well, there's two problems here. A, the encryption block is slow compared to an XOR. For real-time applications, that can be slow. It can take too long because when I talk on a, a, say, a voice over IP application, I'm generating the data. It needs to be sent immediately so that the other person receives it as fast as possible so it sounds like I'm talking direct face to face to them. That is, we need a very small delay between when I talk and when that data is transmitted. <coughs> if I talk 
and we must wait for 64 bits to be generated and then encrypted, then that delay can be too long. It adds delay to our end-to-end -end transmission and when you have high delay when two people talk over the, the phone, it's not a very good conversation. So to cut down on that delay, this is one way we can do this encryption beforehand. It doesn't rely on the plain text <coughs> input. I choose an initialization vector, I choose the key, I encrypt, select the bits, and take the S bits of plain text and can do the fast XOR operation there and get our S bits out and then send them those S bits immediately. So the benefit here is that we don't have to wait for the entire 64 bits. We can just take 8 bits at a time. 8 bits, encrypt, send. 8 bits, encrypt, send. As opposed to wait for 64 bits, encrypt and send. Do we have an example that we can do on the board? Of some of these we do. I do have an example. Let's find it. An example from an exam from a previous year. From 2009, I think. It's the same cipher that we used yesterday in our example. Let's say this is the cipher. That is, we have a 4-bit block cipher, 2-bit key. The first column P shows the input plain text. The next four columns show the output cipher text, depending on the key. We'll use that, or you will use it, to encrypt the value If we have plain text P is zero zero one zero O one O one zero one one zero 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 one one. Do I have the answer? Another one. We'll get started. We'll do that one later. Do this one first. So some practice questions. Try and encrypt the plain text 1101 0111 0001 
0110 using cipher blockchaining. The first or the second mode of operation we went through. <coughs> Not the electronic code book, the second one. And choose an initialization vector of all zeros. This is our cipher. That's a good question. And you'll need the key. The key is zero, zero. <coughs> and as you do that, I'll get some more. the answer but will work. <coughs> First one using CBC. You have the diagram in front of you and this is the cipher on the screen. I'll give you the answer in a moment. Try them. No, uh, they're do the one on the left first. We'll do this one later. We'll do this one later, and this is another one we'll do. So if you've done the first one using CBC, you can try the one over here using the f feedback mode. We haven't done the counter mode yet. You don't have to do it all if you don't want. You can do the first two blocks, so as long as you understand the concept. And once you've done that one, do CFB. Same initialization vector where needed.
So what we did with the cipher block chaining, we took the f we have four bit blocks. So we take four bits of plain text at a time. One one zero one is the first block. We exclusive all with the initialization vector IV, which was chosen. Exclusive all the two values together and take the output and encrypt using our cipher on the screen using key 00. I got this. Well, no, no. <laughs> Looks good. Looks good. Try the next one. So when I encrypt 1101 from our cipher on the screen, 1101 encrypted with z key 00, zero gives us 1101. Not that one, sorry, try That's CFB. One, CFB. Yep. Okay. Try CFB where <coughs> try CFB where S is two bits. Yeah, three blocks is enough. What's the next four blocks of ciphertext? Uh, in this one, no. No, check your... how you feed in the... here. So... So the operation, plain text block, XOR with our initialization vector at the start. The output is encrypted. So I'll show an E here. We take this as the input to our encryptor. This is the output with key 00. zero. Now the next block of plain text, which is 0111, one, one, this block of four bits, we feed the ciphertext block out that came out into here instead of using the initialization vector. Do not use 0000, zero, zero, zero again. Use C1. So XOR P1, uh, sorry, P2 with C1 then encrypt that value, 1010. Zero, one, zero. Gives us 0100. Zero, zero, zero. <coughs> S equals 2 bits. Yes, bit and this card, uh, for in 4 bit block. Uh, it's a 4 bit block. Disc select the leftmost bits. Select the leftmost two bits. In, in your diagram. Select two bits. Yep. <coughs> Any problems with cipher block chaining? Don't do counter yet, do cipher feedback mode, CFB. Where's your answer?
Any problems with the uh, first one? Question on the second one. Okay. Any problems with the first one? Cipher block chaining. So the diagram in front of you is helpful because it shows take the cipher text block and feed it in for the XOR in the next phase. Who got, who got that answer? <laughs> Hang on first, I, I'll get to you. Uh, who, who got that answer for CBC? <coughs> or who, anyone didn't? Anyone get a different answer? If you didn't get an answer, then keep going. If you got a different answer, something went wrong. Ask me and I'll help. Now, next one, CFB. We take it from here. Yeah, the IV is stored in a register. Let's let's look at CFB. I'll uh, go back to our slides. We'll, we'll come back, but let's just show. Let's think we have a register, some value that we'll continue to use, or, or a register, a set of uh, space or memory to use. The initial value is the initialization vector. In our example, it's the same as over there. Same key, IV is 0, 0, 0, 0. We have our 4-bit block cipher, which is on the, the other screen we will go back to. So we take our key 0, 0, initialization vector, encrypt that, we'll get a 4-bit output. Take the leftmost 2 bits, in this case, and XOR those 2 bits with the first 2 bits of our plain text. We'll get C1. And now, this is the, the part that's important, our register stores the current value is It's initialized to the initialization vector, I think, here. That's our register. We take C1 and put it into the right part of the register and shift it along. So the register will become, or maybe a way to draw it. C1 is 2 bits. Uh, the, the, the number in the register doesn't come from the IV. Yes, the initial value of the register is the initialization vector. Yep. We get, we, uh, so we have to do six um, or the, um, I, good, good point. Don't finish this one, it will take too long. Move on to counter mode once you've done two or three blocks. Let's make it. Sorry. So, again, this step, take C1, which is two bits in our example, add it to the end of our register. The register was initialized with all zeros in our case. Add it to the end and shift it along. Since our register is four bits and we've added two bits in the end, we're going to lose the first two bits. So you can think these two disappear. The second two zeros become the first two zeros, and the last two bits become the value of C1, whatever it was. And then encrypt with key 00, zero and do it again. Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, that Can you put up the table on the Good. You will need the table. Or is it the same as the initial session? 
uh, no, the register is the same as the initialization vector. It's whatever you choose. In my example, we chose four zeros. In another example, we could choose something else. But yeah, the register is initialized by IV. Once you've done those three phases, try the counter mode. There's another one, <laughs> output feedback mode. And then there's a fourth one, counter mode. So try counter. Now we have Yes, to, to save some time, there's only six bits in the plain text for CFB. Same key, same initialization vector. I don't know. I don't know. I haven't tried it. <laughs> Get an answer for the other one. One, 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 zero. He got something different. Who else has got an answer? Anyone got an answer for CFB? I can see I've seen two answers, but they're different. Who's got answers for CFB? Again, one. How many ones at the start? Uh, he's got six ones, he's got five ones and a zero. He's got five ones and a zero. Five ones and a zero. I don't have an answer. Um, I want to ask that, um, do we have to use um, this, this register or or we have to use this one again. I mean, like. Uh, so the the question is, and it's a good one. Our register in the second phase, we shifted shifted the register along and took C1 and put it to the end. In the next phase, we'll take these four bits, shift along, and put C2 at the end. We keep changing those values. We don't go back to IV.
So for CFB, I got one 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 zero. Did anyone get that? Hands up, make me feel more confident. Good. If you didn't go get that, let me know. Or see where. So I start with this. Zero. Also, I begin. I begin with yeah. zero, zero. So I have to shift. The red. The register is continually updated. It's a shift register. The register starts with the initial value chosen by the user and continually gets updated based on the previous ciphertext block. Counter mode. Initial value is all zeros. Try counter mode. In counter mode, we increment the counter. Zero, one, two, three, four, and so on. Note that in our example, we use s equal to 2 bits. You could have done s equal to 1 bit, s equal to 3 bits, and work it out. With counter, we, it's still 4 bits. Counter mode, the initial value of the counter is 0. What's the answer? 
counter mode. <coughs> counter mode. <coughs> counter CTR. Let's see what others get. I don't. I don't. Oh, I do have the answer. Uh, so the current is began from 0000 to 0010. Yep. 0010. Yep. Okay. Two more minutes, and then we'll move on. Try the counter mode, just at least the first two blocks. I don't know. After I mark the homework, I think. No quiz, no quiz today. I don't know. I don't know. What do you prefer, quiz or homework? Who has an answer for counter mode? I've seen two answers. Answer, yeah, I've seen your answer. You fixed it. Counter mode. Just try the first two blocks for counter mode. Once you can do that, the principle is easy. <laughs>
Okay, enough. Okay. Let's describe counter mode and also the one we missed, output feedback mode. Cipher, cipher feedback mode, we turned a block cipher into a stream cipher. The decryption, take a look at the decryption. See how the reverse works. With a stream cipher we can operate in real time, that is we can use it for when we need a shorter delay of in, uh, encrypting. So this is a way to, to use one of the well-known and well-studied block ciphers, DES, AES, triple DES, which are considered secure, and turn them into a stream cipher, as opposed to using a dedicated stream cipher, which may not be in, as studied as long and people may not consider as secure. So it's a way of turning a block cipher to a stream cipher. Output feedback mode, very similar to cipher feedback mode. We didn't go through an example. But the difference, it says it's a nonce, but it's an initial va value here. Output feedback mode, take the output of the encryption and feed it in. In our cipher feedback mode, we took the cipher text and fed it into the next round, the next uh, phase. See the difference? If you look at CFB, we took this in CFB. Here we take the output of the encryption. The benefit of this approach is if we're using a communications link where there are errors, in CFB those errors are propagated through the rest of the ciphertext. In this mode, they are maintained or contained within the one ciphertext block. That is, let's say we transmit the ciphertext across our link. There's one bit error, and it's in ciphertext cipher block 2. That is, I transmit 1111 as C2, but it's received as 1110. There's a bit error there. Where there's a bit error, we won't be able to decrypt that. It won't make sense, or it, it will not successfully decrypt. We cannot handle that. But if there's a bit error in this block, since we don't use that value in the next block, it's, it won't be propagated into any further blocks. Whereas with cipher feedback mode, if we have bit errors, or errors then, then they are propagated into the subsequent blocks. So one bit error can mean errors in the rest of the ciphertext. Whereas with output feedback mode, the bit errors are contained <coughs> in one of the blocks. So the benefit is that we can use it for applications where it's likely to have bit errors wireless links, satellite communications, for example. So compared to CFB, it works better if we have bit errors because those bit errors do not propagate into the other portions of the ciphertext. There are some problems with that in... Uh, it's subject to different attacks. Yeah, this is a typo. Well done. Advantage compared to CFB. We're comparing OFB to CFB. The counter mode one, very simple. Initialize with some counter value. Let's say zero, 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 zero. Decimal zero. Encrypt that value. XOR with our four bits of plain text. Get our ciphertext. Increment the counter to decimal one. Encrypt, XOR, get our ciphertext, increment the counter, and so on. This which we've shown, I've shown on the board. Zero in decimal, zero, one, two, three, keeping incrementing the counter. Encrypt the counter, and 
XOR with the plain text. This is simple because there's no connection between the different phases. There's no feedback here. This phase doesn't depend upon this one, which means we can implement this in parallel. That is, I know I have 10 blocks. What I do is choose 10 values, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. The 10 input values count a 1, 2, 3, up to 10. Encrypt those values using my block cipher, same key, and simply, and I can do all them in parallel, I'd say on 10 different processes, and XOR the output of the encryption with uh, each block of the plaintext. So I could implement this in parallel because no, this phase doesn't depend upon the output of this phase. That's not the case with the previous ones. I cannot implement this in parallel because this depends upon the output of this. That is, I must complete this before I can start this. And similar, I must complete the, this one before I can start the next phase. And that's the same with the other CFB and the CBC. One phase depends upon the previous, so in terms of implementation, you, can you cannot start the next phase until the previous one is finished. But that's different with counter mode. You can implement it in parallel, leading to faster implementations. Relatively simple. And decryption is simple as well. Look at these slides. Encryption, counter mode, decryption. What's the difference? It's the algorithm is no different. You just use the ciphertext and plaintext in the opposite order. Take the counter, encrypt XOR with plaintext. Take the counter, encrypt XOR with ciphertext. So again, very simple to implement. Encryption and decryption are the same. Simple and secure. Those four modes, counter mode, output feedback mode, cipher feedback mode, cipher block chaining, are all used and available. Some have advantages over others. All generally considered secure. Uh, when they're used in the right case. Electronic codebook has this problem that when we have a large input plaintext, we get repetitions in the output ciphertext. That's the problem there. Any questions on those yeah. four or five modes? <coughs> yeah. Your counter have to begin from zero or any number? No, the counter does not have to begin at zero, and it doesn't have to increment by one either, as long as you know how it increments or changes. Uh, so I could choose the value 100 and choose to say increment by five, or multiply by two, or maybe, whatever. Maybe not one by one, yeah. or yeah. two or four or... Yeah, so long as it's known, so long yeah. as the sender but, and receiver knows. Know the yeah. In all of these cases, the sender and receiver needed to know the initialization vector, and it should be kept secret. It makes it harder for the attacker if they don't know that. So, in fact, it's another secret thing in, in addition to the key. In some ciphers, in wireless LAN encryption, the original wireless LAN encryption, WEP, WEP, it used in fact, it used a stream cipher, uh, which we'll see later. Uh, one of the problems is that it was easy to find out what the initialization vector is. And once you find the initialization vector, it makes it easier to attack. So keeping the initialization vector secret is of benefit. The last few slides you can look at in your own time. It's a just some combinations and useful, what is it? I can't remember why I put them in. An example of using AES, a special case of a mode of operation built for AES, but we're not cover that. That's all on modes of operation. 
how to take a large piece of plain text and apply a block cipher and combine the cipher text in some way that it's secure. The examples you went through, at least the counter mode and CBC came from 2009 exam, if you want to find the, the working out and the answers. Let's move on. Any questions on modes of operation before we do move on? I think, and in 2009 exam, you weren't given those diagrams. The question was, if you use counter mode, what's the answer? It was in fact decryption as well, and also CBC. Uh, so you may not be given that. I'll, I'll tell you more when we get closer to the exam. I think in one exam, you were given the, the diagrams for those modes. I'm not sure. I'll tell you when it gets closer to the exam. Depends what the question is. But if you're given it, you should be able to read it and, and do the encryption or decryption. Any problems with the, the homework? Last I looked, which was before lunch, I had 32 submissions, which meant I was missing eight submissions, but there may have been more after lunch. When you send, if you haven't submitted, when you send, make sure the email, some people had problem possibly with Hotmail, so make sure how can you test? You could try and send the email to yourself. The cipher text should be in rows of the same length, around 60 or 70 characters, so it looks even. Like if it, it looks like a block, but if it all goes over one line, then that's a problem. It's a problem with the email client. If, if it doesn't come through correctly, I'll, I'll respond in an email. Uh, no, solve it some other way. I, it's an it's a important problem because the base 64 encoding that we use is designed so that it is only a fixed length. And it was in fact designed for sending such information across emails. So you shouldn't have to attach it. It should work. If you've got an option to send as plain text in your client, then that should fix it. But if it comes through and I cannot read it, I will send back a response. We're at the end of this topic, we'll talk about stream ciphers a bit more and give a, an example of a, a cipher designed purely as a stream cipher. But first, random numbers. Who? We need a volunteer. <laughs> volunteer. Choose a random number. Random number. Too slow. Choose a random number. Nine, nine, nine. 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 <laughs> How did you choose that? Because I like it. Okay. Now he chose it because he's li he liked it. It's not so random. How does your laptop choose a random number? Random function. How is that random function implemented? <laughs> Remember, a computer just does what it's programmed to do. So the random function is just program some algorithm. So it's deterministic. It follows a set of steps and it will always follow those steps. So how do we get something random from a computer? 
time, use some the time, but the time is not random. The time is structured. Use. How does your computer do that? <laughs> Use the time. Use the time as an argument to the random function. But if I put the two, if I call that function twice, and use the time, well, there's two problems. How is that random function implemented? And if I use the same time as input, I'll get the same output. It's deterministic in that way. Um, the question comes back, how is that random function implemented? <coughs> Takes a time as input, what does it do on the time? It must follow some rules, that is there must be some algorithm as to how it manipulates the time. In fact, it's not easy to generate random numbers for computers because computers are deterministic. And we talk about pseudo-random numbers, not really truly random. So we talk about pseudo-random numbers, but your calculator has a random number or a pseudo-random number generator. It uses some algorithm to generate not truly random numbers, but numbers that look random. How do we do that is what we're going to talk about. Often when we say random, it's in fact pseudo-random, not truly random. Why do we need random numbers in security? We'll see some mechanisms that rely on random numbers. Key distribution, if we need to all distribute secret keys amongst each other, then some algorithms rely on using random numbers to make sure that distribution works securely. Authentication, in some cases, relies on random numbers. Sometimes we'd like to generate a key. I don't want to let any of you generate a key because I've seen some of the keys you send me in your homework, <laughs> and not many are random. I can brute force more than half of your keys, I would think. Because a lot of you chose keys for your homework which are structured, based on a sequence, based on your ID number, or whatever. So, so they are not random numbers. So to, be, to provide strong security and prevent against brute force and other attacks, we need random values, random keys. The brute force the analysis we spoke about assumes that the user chose a random key, <coughs> not a key that is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F. And I've seen one of them, and they're similar. So when we generate keys for different algorithms, we need random numbers to be secure. A stream cipher. A stream cipher takes a random number XORs with the plain text and gets the ciphertext. Similar to what we saw, we took some output of our block cipher, XOR with plain text, and gets ciphertext. So we need random numbers in different applications in security. What is random? There are different ways to uh, describe randomness. Some things, a uniform distribution of the bits, if we're talking about a binary number. If I choose a long random number, there should be the same number of zeros as ones. If I choose a 64-bit random number and there are 64 ones, and I choose another random number of 64 bits and there are 63 ones and the next one, and most of the time I, I choose a thousand random numbers of 64 bits and on average there are 60 ones in there, and only four zeros, that would not be considered random. We would expect, on average, to be half ones and half zeros. Not just in the entire sequence, but in any subsequence as well. And we expect independence of those numbers. If we have a sequence of bits, 
one bit doesn't depend upon the previous bit, or one subsequence of bits doesn't depend upon the previous subsequence. So they should be independent of each other. And related, it should be hard to predict the next value in a sequence. We will see that we often don't just need one random number, we need a set or a sequence of random numbers. Let's say I need 10 random numbers. The first, it should be hard if we know the first random number in the sequence, it should be hard to predict what the next one will be. That's a good property of when we see pseudo-random number generators. Hard to predict what the value in the sequence will be given one of them. What generates random numbers? Well, we can talk about true random number generators and pseudo-random number generators. True random number generators use some unknown, uh, not some unknown, some some source that we don't fully understand. <laughs> usually some, or some source in, in nature, usually. Uh, or some physical source. So something from the physical environment, like how radiation decays over time. The uh, noise generated from electronic devices. If you can measure that noise, then that we don't fully understand what the structure of that noise is. We can consider that to be truly random. But normally, true random number generators come from nature or, or physical devices. Other things may be uh, or are used in practice, uh, maybe keyboard, mouse activity, if you're talking about a computer, the activity on the, the devices, the hardware devices. The activity on the, uh, the spinning of the disks, the time between pressing keys, uh, the clicking of the mouse in different locations, uh, the use of the memory, some of them exhibit close to truly randomness. <coughs> the problem with such devices for generating true random numbers is it's very hard to use. If I want a my Java function to generate a random number. So I call the rand method, or the whatever it's called in Java, and that gets the value from some attached device that measures the radiation around me, or the noise uh, from different electronic devices. Most computers don't have such a device attached or built in. And having such a device <coughs> is usually expensive, and does not provide many random numbers over a short period of time. So there's a website, uh, do I have it listed? Uh, uh, called random.org. There are different websites that list random numbers. Where did they get them from? They said it's from many. So what they do is they get them from uh, true random number generators. How convenient is it for your? random function on your, in your Java program to go to that website to get a random number and call it again. is not very convenient, especially if you don't have web access. So yes, there are sources for true, true random numbers that come from the nature, basically, and have been collected in websites, uh, in books, and so on. But the convenience of using them, especially if I want to use many, Every packet I send, I need a new random number to do some encryption. Then I need millions of random numbers uh, over a period of seconds. Then that's hard to get such random numbers from true random number generators. They're usually inconvenient to use, and they produce a small number of values. What does your operating system do? Some deal with random numbers in different ways. In, in a Unix-based operating system, there's a device called random, or urandom, and it, your, the operating system kernel keeps track of things of mouse clicks, of keyboard events, of 
uh, hard disk events and uses the time between them and some different algorithms to uh, treat that as a true random number or close to true. Um, how do we get it? So there's a device on the operating system. Other operating systems have similar things. So they keep track of the physical events on your computer to generate random numbers. And then you can use that in some program to access them. Uh, this is just some random sequence. If you look, not at this column or here, but something that come from my computer that is a pseudo-random sequence of numbers. Again, the problem with this, if you want a truly random sequence, then it only generates so many bits per second. So it's quite slow in generating because it uh, takes time to collect all the data. Again, if you need random numbers quickly, and many of them, it may not be fast enough. So random number generation is not easy. That's the point. In computers, we use algorithms or pseudo-random number generators. Some algorithm to calculate numbers which looks random, a relatively random, not truly random. To make these algorithms work better, they usually have an input called the seed, and usually to make them work better, the seed may come from a true random number generator. One of the problems with a true random number generator is they can only produce small number of values over time. <coughs> so what we can do is take that as an input to some algorithm and use that algorithm and the input C to generate a longer sequence of random numbers. Which we'll see is necessary for, for many applications, many random numbers or bits. So a pseudo-random number generator uses some algorithm to produce a continuous stream of bits, random bits. A pseudo-random function is the same but produces a, a fixed set of bits. What does it say? But produces a string of bits of some length, I think it should say. Just an illustration of that. A true random number generator takes some source of true randomness, converts it to binary, and we get a stream of bits, a sequence of bits, random bits. A pseudo-random number generator takes some seed value, some initial value, and some deterministic algorithm, and applies that algorithm to get some pseudo-random stream of bits. A true random number generator is preferable for the randomness, but is less convenient in that it doesn't produce as long a stream in the same amount of time as a pseudo-random number generator, and it requires some source of true randomness, which is not always available. Similar, a pseudo-random function is just an algorithm that takes some seed and produces just one value. A stream is a continuous sequence of bits. <coughs> Let's finish with one example of a pseudo-random number generator, a simple one. Linear congruential generator. generator. It's hard to say. It's a simple algorithm that takes, has some, some constant or some fixed parameters, some modulus m, which is positive, some multiply a, which is less than m, so, some increment c, which is less than m, and the initial seed, the seed value, the initial value x0. And the goal is to, this is the algorithm, take 
the current value of x multiplied by a plus c mod m and you get the next value x. And we can produce, uh, we continue applying that to get a stream of numbers. Is it random? Or does it produce a stream of random numbers? Let's have a, a few small examples. It depends upon the values chosen of m, a and c. Let's start simple. I'll choose A in this to be 1 and C to be 1. And let's choose M to be 100. So the equation becomes XN plus 1 equals XN mod M, mod 100. Uh, why is that? Plus 1, sorry. Xn plus 1 mod 100. Just by choosing A and C to be 1 and M to be 100. And let's choose an initial value to get started. Choose 23. There's some value. My favourite number. What's X1? This is our pseudo random number generator. What is X1? Quick, we only have five minutes left. We need to go through two more examples. 23 plus 1. Mod 100. 24. X1 is 24. What's X2? X2 is 24 plus 1. 25. Mod 100. 25. X3. Let's write down the sequence. And once we get to 99, 100, mod 100 will wrap around to 0. And eventually we'll come back to 23. And then we'll come back. <coughs> 23, 24, 25, 26, so on. Does that look like a random sequence of numbers? No. Not a very good random number generator. <coughs> Try some different <coughs> values of A and C and M. A equals 7. Our multiplier is 7, so it's 7 times the previous value. C is 0, plus nothing, mod 32. X0 is 1, so X1 will be 7 times 1, mod 32. 7 times 1 is, one, is 7, mod 32 gives us 7. X2 is the previous value, 7 times our multiplier, which is also 7, 49, mod 32, 17. Looking better, isn't it? At least it's not 23, 20, or 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. X3, 17 times 7, mod 32, is 23. I've got the answer for you. We just multiply the previous number by 7, mod 32, x4, 23 times 7 is 161, mod 32, is 1, x5, x6, X7, 23. It's going to wrap around. So, our sequence is 1, 7, 17, 23. So, just those four values. After that, we wrap around. So, that's our sequence of random numbers. It looks a little bit more random. 1, 7, 17, 23 is better than 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But the sequence is not very long. 
what we need is an algorithm that will generate a large sequence of numbers that look random. One last one and you'll be able to finish it. A, what did I write? Uppercase. A equals 5, C equals 0, <coughs> M equals 32. That is the same as the previous one, but change A from 7 to 5. And the sequence, we won't calculate it, the sequence you get is 5. 5 times, five times 1 is 5, mod 32 is 5. The next one will be 25, 5 times 5. Next one is 29, 17, 21, 9, 13, 1, and back to 5. So in fact, our sequence, if we just change A from 7 to 5, 5, 25, 29, 17, 21, 9, 13, 1, and then back to 5 and repeat. So the <coughs> length of the sequence in the previous case was 4, here we have 8 different numbers. They look random. That is, I can't see any pattern obviously, 5, 25, 29, it doesn't look structured. So using this algorithm with the right parameters we can generate a sequence of numbers which are pseudo-random so long as we select, select the right parameters. You can try that one and you can try variations and see what the optimal set of parameters are. And people have done that and find out which of these have an impact. What's important is the length of the sequence should be long. And to do that, M should be large. Mod 32, the length of the sequence is going to be contain the numbers between 0 and 31, no more. If it's mod 1,000, we have a potential of having 1,000 different values in the sequence. Mod 1 million, 1 million different values. So make M as large as possible, depending upon your computer, a 32-bit number. And there are only a few good values for A if you set C to 0. This is one example. <laughs> Try that, <laughs> and we'll continue next week. Enough for today.